Once I was clothed in the rags of my sin, wretched and poor, lost and lonely within, but with wondrous compassion, the King of all kings, pity and love took me under his wing yes. oh yes oh yes i'm a child of the king his royal blood now flows in my veins and i wretched and poor now can sing praise God praise God I'm a child of the King now I'm a child with a heavenly home my holy father has made me his own and i'm cleansed by his blood and i'm clothed in his love and someday i'll sing with the angels above oh yes oh yes i'm a child of the king his royal blood now flows in my veins and i who was wretched and poor now can sing Praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'm glad I'm a child of the King. Amen. Amen. I trust that you can join with me in that. But it's good to be back in the Lord's house the second Sunday of this another year. None of us know what may be in uh, in view of this coming year. We certainly had no idea of last year, did we? But we can look back over that part and say, well, the Lord was there. The Lord helped me. The Lord did this or that or answered my prayer, whatever it may have been. But if you stop to think on this year, what God may have in store for you, as we enter into a new year, as far as our years are concerned, what God has in store for each one of us. I want to speak today for just a little while out of the book of Joshua. And use this thought, being kept alive for this adventure. God has kept us alive, all of us, for this coming year and the adventure of what's ahead. And I want to take the scripture and prove this point to you, that God has a purpose in doing as he did and as he does. It's not something that I just dreamed up, but it's something that's in the Word of God. In Joshua chapter 15, 14, excuse me, Joshua chapter 14, we know the story of uh, these people as they uh, came out of Egypt, and God took them around a longer way to keep them out of harm's way. And he brought them to a place that's called Kadesh Barbadia. And there they 
looked and they thought, well, we've, we've crossed over the Red Sea. We've come through all of these uh, uh, circumstances and what we faced as the enemy, and we've made it this far. But just on the other side of this Jordan River lies a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It's a place that God has prepared for no other people but for us. And he's going to give that to us. And so we're going to ask, and I don't know how the, all of this come about. The Bible doesn't really say, but they chose 12 men to go in and to spy out the land. And so they went across the Jordan River. They went in. They looked it over, and uh, they had entered at that time in that place, if you were to look at the map, of where in relations to Jericho and uh, where they were at Kadesh Barbadia, uh, you would see that, that being very close to one another. And what separated them was the Jordan River. They went over, and 10 of those that gave their report was a report that there was giants in the land. And we're like grasshoppers. And there's no way that we can do what we're asked to do. Joshua and Caleb gave a good report. And they said, God shall and will provide and make a way. He told her the good things of that side or the other side of the river. But it all came down to making that choice and decision. God was not pleased with what he heard. And so you know the, you know the end of that story. They were uh, those that uh, had fought the battle, so to speak, and uh, the second time around, after 40 years, they went back. And uh, actually, if you study Scripture, you'll find that it was 45 years when they went back, and I'll show you that in a moment. I've heard that all my life, and I'm sure you have as well. But if you go by the, by the birth of Caleb, uh, you'll see it was 45 years. He was 85 years old when they came back the second time to Kadesh Barbadia. So in doing so, that time doesn't really matter. It could have been one week. It wouldn't have mattered. But it happened that it was 40 years. We'll use that. And all of those that were under the age of 20 were spared. But all of those older ones were not spared. They all passed away. We're talking about a group of people that, that were around 2 million people. So I'm sure that in their journey around that one mountain, they came back to that same place and that same cemetery where they had buried their loved ones. And they had to think about the choice and the decision that they made the first time they were there and how they were wrong in what they did. Has there ever been a time in life, and sometimes as we look back over last year, we might think to ourselves and not saying anything to anybody, you know, I believe I could have done better. I believe I could have done better than I did. Or I may have done more or could have done more. It could be either way. But here in this story, as we read verses 10 through 15, Verse 7, and I said I'd show you the age here of Caleb. Verse 7 says, 40 years old when I went 
Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barbadia to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land wherein thy feet have trod shall be thine inheritance and thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, and he said, These forty and five years, ever since the Lord spake these words unto Moses, when the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. That's where you find the time they had actually spent there in the wilderness. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how that the uh, Amaleks were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of uh, Hebron, from for, uh, for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jehoshaphat, and Kadesh unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. This is correctly read, and the name of Hebron before was Kadesh Babadiah, which Arab was a great man among the Amaleks, and the land had rested from war. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we've read your precious word this morning and realizing, God, that what we read here in the scriptures, not only has it happened in that day, but, Father, you have given to us as a child of God an inheritance. You've given us your blessings. You've put your hand by the Holy Spirit upon each life that's saved and delivered from the snares of the devil. God, you've filled us and led us and blessed us. You've taken care of us. You've provided for us. You've given us health and strength and houses and lands and all the things that we have today. It wasn't by our ability, but, Lord, it was by your will, purpose, and plan. Bless now, I pray, this scripture as we reveal what we see as we look at this man. And for such a day and such an hour as this was his life spared. For in Christ we do pray. God's people said, Amen. Well, we know the story. I mentioned that just a moment ago. But some things that I want to mention here, that by the time they came back to Kadesh Barbadia, Caleb had become an older man at the age of 85. And the first time he was there, he was 40. But God spared him and he spared Joshua because of a good report. But everyone else at the age of 20 and older, they died. It pays to listen to God. It pays to read your Bible. Maybe this year we need to read more. Maybe this year we need to pray more than we did last year. But anyhow, Caleb had been kept alive, according to verse number 10, for this very adventure. Life is an adventure. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, I've had one, haven't you? I've had one, I'm telling you. 
and many of you have as well. But God's kept you alive for this very for this very moment. Our young people that are here, God is going to bless you and use you, I believe, in a mighty way. But listen very carefully and attentively to what God's saying and realize that that small, stall, small still voice that speaks on the inside, that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't in the thunder. He wasn't in the rain. He was in that small, still voice. That's how God speaks. And he'll speak to you that way. Caleb said, the Lord has kept me alive. I believe we all could say that today. God has kept me alive for this very day, for a purpose that God has, and for his plan to be fulfilled. You see, God knew the first time when they were there what was going to happen when they went back the second time. And he knew what God was going to give. We're kept alive for what we're going to face this coming year. And beloved, we will face some things. No question about it. But God's going to help us. Today, you can look at our society and the world in which we live, the political decisions that are being made, the moral decisions that are made, and how that many of those are nothing more than corruption. And the righteousness, the Bible said, will inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. Thank God for those that are saved by the grace of God. Now, to be meek doesn't mean that you have to lay down and just let somebody walk all over you. No, no. But meek means to believe and to stand for what you believe in. Amen. So here we see this. Now, you see, he had become wiser as he'd gotten older. There are many today that are older than even I am, and I'm not a spring chicken no more. <laughs> I didn't hear not even one amen. Brother Will and I were talking uh, right before church, and I said, I still feel as good as I did when I was 25, only it's three times worse. That's the way it works, amen? God has blessed me. When I stood here, November the 6th, God blessed me with an experience I've never gotten over. And I've tried to share it with other people. Some people don't understand what I'm trying to say. But what I'm saying here today, I have somewhat more wisdom today than I had before that experience. And I want to share that with all of you. Amen. Don't be nervous. God's got it all under control. Amen. Today, I believe as he did, he said, I'm stronger than I ever was. I have more power, more will, and I am wiser today than I was then. As we grow older, we should grow wiser. I read a plaque that was in an office of a, a general manager that I was uh, meeting with it last Friday. And it said, uh, when you have learned all that you know, and uh, in other words, when you think you've learned it all, it's what you learn from there on out that'll really make the difference. So when you get to the place in life that you think you know it all, there's still a whole lot that's got to be learned. Amen. No matter how wise. Be good if Washington knew that today, wouldn't he? The Bible tells us this. Caleb had strength for the day. I'm glad God gives us strength, aren't you? I've got strength today. I realize that at 85 years old, he uh, refused to believe that he was weak or that he was beyond the age of work. We've all got a job to do. And some can do it in different ways. He focused on the strengths rather than the weakness. My God shall supply what? All of my needs. He'll give you strength. He'll give you health. He'll give you what you need. 
God will speak to you if you'll let him do it. Amen. Let me hurry. I can hear the dinner bell. <laughs> Caleb was 85, and he was looking forward to the adventure that was before him. I'll tell you this. We all want to live as long as we can. Amen. Am I right? And we've gone through some times of sorrow and grief and separation, and it has touched every one of us, some more than others. But nevertheless, we have to adjust our hearts to realize that we cannot bring them back, but one day we can go to be with them, just as David did. Caleb viewed that the strength he had was sufficient for whatever was ahead. Don't ever tell the Lord, I can't do that. You know what you're saying and the devil's smiling? I'm too weak. I'm not smart enough. Caleb didn't do that. He said, even at that age, my strength is as good now as it was then. Now, I believe his strength of faith was as good or better. His wisdom had grown in the period of time that he had been there and seen what the Lord had done during those years uh, of wandering. I believe that he became very close to Moses, and he listened very carefully to what Moses had to say. For he knew that Moses was the instrument by which God was going to use in order to guide them and direct them to where they needed to go. Don't let any of us, including myself, think we know it all. For we've got a lot to learn as we live in this life. And the more that I study and the more that I read, the more I realize I didn't know as much now as I thought I knew when I was 30 years old. I've gained a notch or two. Amen. So, let's go ahead. Philip believed God had equipped him for this adventure. I believe God gives us a strength, don't you? He made this statement, give me this mountain. What did Jesus say about a mountain? If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed and you pray and ask God to remove this mountain, whatever it may be, it may be that somebody that's lost, it could be sickness, it could be a lot of things, remove this mountain. And God said, it'll be removed. But then Jesus came along and he made this statement about that same fact. He said, even though you have the faith to believe to move a mountain and have not charity, it profit you nothing. You see those two go hand in hand. See what I'm talking about? When you see someone that's hurting or sick or, or, or sick by some means, that could be only by the grace of God. It's not me or it's not you. So we need to pray for them. Amen. And show a heart of charity, of love to that person. Well, preacher, do they have to be saved? No. You can love a sinner. You can't love his sin. But you can love him enough to lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have faith to believe, as that grain of mustard seed, to move that mountain, and you have the charity of God to go with that, watch out, devil. Here you come. Amen. That's the way it'll be. You know, you heard people say over there in Matthew when it was stated, uh, you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed and move mountain. They stop right there. But you need to read on and see what he had to say about that faith and about that mustard seed and how that God said, if you link that in your life with compassion and charity for others, 
Thank God for that. Amen. Boy, I could preach right there for a while. We see that. We seen it in the in the last year and a half, two years, when this COVID thing came about and people panicked. Amen. First thing that happened, they panicked. And whoever and whatever said something that could be used or done or you do this or do that, it'd take care of it. People was jumping at that. But how many people really and truly got on their knees and said, God, you've took care of me for all these years and you're able to do that for me right now. And so I'm going to put you first in this situation. My life's in your hands. My whole being is in your hand. Why should I try to do what something that you can do for me? Amen. So you say, preacher, you're digging a hole. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. That if you believe God, God will take care of you. It may be tough sometimes, but God will take care of you. Amen. I'm simply saying today, I'm, t I'm trusting the great physician, not the one that's practicing. Okay? Are you with me? Say amen. You want me to go for another hour? Say amen. <laughs> Health problems may come to every one of us. We need to pray. That's what this altar's for. This is an altar that's been set aside. It's been ordered by God to this church to use this altar. Not just for somebody that's lost, but it's for you and I that are saved and we've got a problem. Amen. Jesus said, if you don't ask, you're not going to receive. If we ask God, we're going to receive. The devil will tell you, and he's tried it on me. He'll say, there's no need in you going up there. God knows all about that. By act of faith, sometimes we'll move the compassionate heart of a holy God toward the answer of your prayer. And that's how it ought to be. We've not got Ed here for an altar. We've got a blood altar here. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank God for that, that was shed for my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. It was to take away our sins, not to cover them up, but to take them away, never to be remembered again. And if that's a fact in our life, and it is if you're saved, then this altar is your place of communion with God. This is where you run when you got a problem. This is where you bring them whenever you want to pray for them. It's what God knows, and it'll touch his heart to see you moving toward those things that moves toward God. If you want to see, the Bible said that with Abram, his faith was counted to him for what? Righteousness. Am I right? Look at how many altars that man built in his life. Eight of them. Everywhere he went, he built an altar to the Lord. He minded God even when he came to the point of God asking him, would you sacrifice your only son? He said, God, I'll do it. It'll break my heart, but I'll do it. And he went that way. And God did supplied a ram and spared his son. God spared us by giving us a Savior that through Him, He became the propitiation for our sins. Romans chapter 5, not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. That poor sinner out there, he's never come to the realization that God loved him enough to sin and let his son die for his sins. All he can see is an answer in the bottom of a bottle or a needle. All he can see is in a pill he can take to make him feel good for a while. If he ever gets 
blessed by the Holy Spirit of God to draw him unto the Lord. God will break it just like that. He'll break the yoke of bondage and set the captive free. Amen. He said that in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord hath anointed me to preach this gospel, to open the bars to those that are bound, to set the captive free, and the year of deliverance to those that are held captive. There are a lot of people need to be delivered today. Amen. You say, demons, devils? Could be. But most of it's self. It's the flesh. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know what wisdom will do for all of us? It'll make us a better servant for the Lord. We become a better servant. We have more of an understanding. We have a heart that, that, that is open to God. There are many times when I go in to study, and I'm, I'm talking about it at our home, and I just sit there, and I just think about the service. I think about what I've heard. I think about what people have requested. And I say, Lord, I know I heard all that. And I'm thankful for that. But Lord, I know you knew it before it was ever spoken. Would you just help them with their need? Would you help them answer their prayer? It's in that time of being in that prayer closet that's my study. Being there and realizing that God's there with me. He's right there. And there are times that I can feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. There are times that I can't. But regardless, He's still there. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to be with you. But I'm going to speak about my personal experience for just a moment. There are times that I get in that study and my heart's just literally open. I just pour it out to God. And it's those times when God gets so close to me that it's almost like he's feeling breathing on you. And that's when God answers the prayers that I have called upon him. Now, I think it's great to pray in church. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I think it's great to call upon the name of the Lord. I think it's a great opportunity for all of us to use this altar and to bring our burdens, our objects before the Lord. We should never be ashamed to do that. For we're coming to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right here is where we pray. But I believe honestly for me, it's those times in that study when I'm there just communing with God that for me, I feel like that I am close to Him in the communion of the Holy Spirit of God. At times I can't do nothing but cry. Just sit there and cry. God knows that's a language. There have been many that I've, I've had that experience. I'm not saying this boasting, but what I am saying is we need to pray more this year than we did last year. We need to have a more compassionate heart for those that are lost than we had last year. And not look at them and say, well, they know. They ought to know. They live in America and they ought to know this. Well, how much did you know when you were out there? You see what I'm trying to say? So wisdom will enable you to serve the Lord. And understanding, they go hand in hand. Understanding will give you a greater compassion for those that hurt. We've all had times of hurt, haven't we? We have. 
So I close with this. Doing God's will in your life will prove that this year of 2024 will be the greatest adventure in your entire life if you'll do it God's way. If you'll do it God's way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We're told that. Then last of all, God has a great adventure and a plan for this church. I've been here a number of years now, and I thank God for this. But the truth of the matter is we could have done more than we've done. But sometimes as humans, we decide, I've done enough. I'm not going to do no more. I've done my part. You get that attitude, God will just draw back, and he'll let you do it. But you say, God, we need you. Our young people need you. Our older people need you. Our teenagers need you. And Lord, I need you. Amen. This is not an altar just to see to. This is an altar that God pays close attention to what goes on here. Caleb knew that. Which side of that river are we on? I want to be on God's side, don't you? I hope it's been a blessing. Let's stand together. Pray for us as we pray for you. Pray for our families. We often say, let's pray for our Sunday school and our Sunday school teacher. That's a good thing to say that. But if you don't back it, you don't mean it. Amen. Amen. That's my thoughts, and I believe that's God's eye. Let's pray. As we, Brother Bruce, dismiss us, please.